when uh, COVID first hit our consciousness, um, I was nervous, didn't really know what was going on. Flying to Sydney, I'm in Melbourne Airport, um, you know, everything was uh, extremely concerning of what I was being told in the media and also in uh, my friendship circles. I have uh, some uh, friends that work in finance and they were talking about what they were hearing through government agencies about how it was going to be, uh, you know, a major pandemic. It was going to be seriously worrying. So I was questioning my sanity even at the time I was in the airport because I was like, you know, should I be flying? And so I, uh, you know, would normally rather than buying a water bottle, just drink from the bubblers at the airport. I was like, oh, maybe I won't. Um, and so there was some... Um, there was concern because I didn't really know what was going on. Um, I spoke with my mother at the time because this is when, you know, start isolating from old people. Mm. And I said to mum, what do you want to do? It's your choice. You know, your granddaughter lives 50 metres away. Um, we will keep her away from you if you want. And mum was like, well, you know, I'm in my late 70s. Um, we don't know how long this is going to go on. I'm perfectly happy to continue having contact and, and, and take that risk. Um, so that was sort of where we got to. I didn't feel overly concerned for my own well-being. Um, my wife, who works in the medical industry, was uh, much more nervous, not so much for herself, but just because of what was likely to happen to um, the radiography, radiology clinic that she worked at. Um, and then as things progressed, I became... Concerned about things that were happening, um, but didn't really understand the totality of what was happening. Uh, and then in June of... May or June of 2020, I don't recall exactly, um, I thought I was having a stroke. Um, my hands stopped, uh, that I lost grip strength. Uh, so I rang a friend of mine to take me to the Castlemaine Hospital spent four or five hours there. They then transferred me to Bendigo um, and they put on a, like a, a, a 12 dot or greater um, a, a ECG monitor for my heart. Um, and when we got there, they were like, look, it, everything's fine, but there's some weird rhythms within this ECG. Um, we don't know what's causing your problem. Uh, it was very quickly ruled out to be a stroke because my hands, both hands had lost grip strength. Usually a stroke is one side of the body. Um, so I spent the night in the ED in, um, in Bendigo and then got sent home and they requested that I attend an echocardiogram. Uh, so I had heart surgery when I was five uh, and my uh, pulmonary valve uh, didn't operate properly. So they operated on the valve itself. Obviously I had to cut the heart open to do that. Um, and they fixed it and they said that it'll be right for the rest of your life. But this was the early eighties. Um, and, uh, what the echocardiogram revealed was the fact that, uh, my valve had failed and I had 54% of my blood flowing the wrong direction through that valve. Mm -hmm. So it, I, I was suffering from a lot of lethargy and they've never worked out what triggered the, the loss of hand strength It may it's assumed to be completely unrelated. Um, and, uh, but it explained the exhaustion and the brain fog. Um, so I was told that it needed to be dealt with, um, as quickly as possible. Um, and their preference was, uh, normally it would be within three months. Um, but because of COVID, they couldn't guarantee it. They said, um, that my right ventricle was, already enlarged but and it would continue to enlarge and it did and that compounded the issues because the more the larger the right side of my heart got the uh the more the um the valve seat was enlarged and and distorted so the valve efficiency reduced even further um and so in the context of covid uh, at that point in time i was just like um I was quite despondent, to be perfectly honest. Um, I felt that I, I couldn't be given a, uh, a date of being operated on. Um, I was considered an elective um, patient because 
I was not in imminent danger of dying, which I completely understand and agree with. I think we have to have a triage system in our hospitals. Um, but it, it left me uh, bereft of being able to plan. Um, I was also told to stop exercising, um, which for me, uh, I do a sedentary job. So without that exercise, uh, I, I felt very unbalanced um, physically and mentally as a result of the sedentariness. Um, and that went on, you know, and, and the lockdowns were uh, extremely difficult, yet we were blessed to live in regional Victoria nonetheless. Uh, they were quite surreal in a lot of ways. Um, and then I also saw a lot of my friends and family starting to eat each other, for want of a better expression, um, about the correct courses of action. Um, and I tried to stay uh, uninvolved in either side. I, I was trying to just make sure that friendships and loved ones didn't end up um, at the end of all of this with ir irreparable damage to their relationships. So I guess that was the place I came to. Um, but my personal experience was, um, as, was one of being left waiting uh, because I, did, I had no idea about when I could or could not get operated on. Um, I had to go to Bendigo Hospital three or four times with breathing difficulties, complications from um, uh, the condition I was suffering. Um, and then I think in April of 2021, I saw my surgeon and uh, I said, I'm more than happy to go on a short waiting list. On sometime in July, I got a phone call on a Friday saying, um, you know, the preceding Friday, we can operate on you if you can do that. So um, I did that and um, attended the hospital. Um, I had uh, open heart surgery. Uh, so there's two scars there. That's the scar from when I was five years old. And this very thin scar is the most recent one. The scar tissue when you're a child grows much faster than when you're an adult. So that's why that scar is so big. So the incision was no different. It's just that you have an overgrowth of scar tissue when you're a child. Um, so I got operated on, it all went well, um, painful and, and debilitating uh, nonetheless. Um, and then came home to recuperate. So then my, um, experience of COVID changed uh, in the sense that uh, I would have, I was advised not to get the vaccine until April or May of 2022 at the earliest, but the preference was for me not to have it. Now, the person that told me that um, asked to not have me disclose who they were. They were quite nervous about talking about it, but they felt that it was the right thing to do to inform me. Um, I had already heard about the myocarditis uh, uptick um, in people. So I was nervous. I was actually um, open-minded about vaccines. Um, I've had tuberculosis, I've had yellow fever, my daughter's vaccinated. So I didn't have any um, structural uh, opposition to the idea of being vaccinated. Um, but I asked, can I get a medical exemption? I tried to ask a GP, no one would give me an exemption. Um, but I had been advised, you know, whilst in hospital that it was not a great idea for me. Um, and at first it didn't really matter that much because things hadn't been mandated. But when things were mandated and, uh, and then we had um, vaccine passports, um, I was very much, I felt like I was stuck in between a rock and a hard place. Um, I'd been given confidential advice because of the, I guess, the, the governmental desire to have a uniformity of message so that, you know, because I think that they were coming from a position of we need to protect as many people as possible. So there was this sort of top down rollout of that messaging, um, which I can at some level sympathize with and understand. Um, 
but yeah, once vaccine passed, and, and actually around the time I got released from hospital was when the first news of the fact that the vaccines were in fact leaky. They were not a sterilising vaccine. And so there were reports, uh, I think it was at that time that um, Dr Fauci in the States said the reason we're reintroducing masks is because um, a vaccinated person that is a rare breakthrough case uh, has the same viral load in the nasopharynx as a, an unvaccinated person and that's why we want people to start wearing masks indoors. So I must admit my, my heart fell at that time as well because I was just like, uh, when will this uh, COVID disruption stop? Because um, I instinctively knew, well, if... if, if if they're a leaky, the, the, the concept of herd immunity has just gone out the window. So when will we see an end to restrictions? And uh, I think it was four days after I was released from hospital. It may even have been two or three. Um, I can't remember the, you know, absolutely specifically, was when we went into that massive lockdown. Mm. Um, and I was incredibly lucky to even have gotten in. So since the operation, um, I felt incredibly blessed to have even had the operation because the elective waiting list has gotten even longer and um i can't actually imagine um having had another eight months of waiting um a i would have gone well past what they considered to be the safe amount of uh, enlargement of my my right ventricle um but more on an emotional level i i i uh i would have been preferred i would have preferred to have been told you can't have an operation because at least I would have then had something to manage mentally, um, but uh, but but yeah, I don't think I could have dealt with that not knowing. Um, you know, maybe that's my fallibility, but nonetheless, that's the way I, I think. I, I just don't think I would have dealt with it very well. Maybe I would have if I had to go through it. Um, and so, when vaccine passports were introduced, um, I was during my recovery. I was going to the local pool swimming five times a week and having a sauna five times a week and was starting and this this began in october when i because i had three months where i was not allowed to do anything like that for structural reasons from the, the the physical trauma of the operation but after 12 weeks i was told um that i um could start exercising again uh so i was no longer allowed to go to the pool i found that to be challenging um i wasn't able to go to a sauna uh, which did seem to be helping with my recovery. Um, and it hardened my resolve about the entire uh, subject of vaccines and vaccine mandates, etc. because I felt that I very much fell into a legitimate grey area. It shouldn't have been a grey area, but it was, because I had uh, had a heart operation, I'd been advised uh, not to have the vaccine, I could not get an exemption. Um, so I became even more sort of, uh, conscious of the civil liberties, uh, violations that I felt were occurring. Um, I have always had a, a, a degree of cynicism around authority. My grade four teacher was jailed. Um, I suffered at the hands of that grade four teacher. So I don't. I'm not opposed to society and rules, etc. But I've also had a, a I guess, a, a perspective about um, power structures imposing their will upon people that don't have the ability to um, shield themselves or, or rebut that, uh, that imposing of will. There are legitimate times at which mandates overrule body um, autonomy but that is if we can trust the governing powers that are that are um, mandating yes so while you know things might be different if COVID was Ebola or COVID was the Spanish flu and yes it, it would be a, a very different argument but yeah with the leaky vaccines the censorship mm -hmm. the the lack of nuance response the impossibility of exemption and those doctors giving out exemptions punished the one story stick to one story narrative of the particularly in the western media world the legacy yes. media all of these things add up to something mm -hmm. and i think the other thing too is the labeling the the 
attacking anybody for for questioning mm. the stick to one message narrative mm. is an anti-vaxxer. You know, I personally that's... found that very offensive because, as I said, I had uh, yellow fever. I've got my tuberculosis shots. I've travelled extensively, um, and I had no structural opposition to two vaccines. Um, but I also had a, a, a nuanced perspective that in certain scenarios, it's like uh, giving people a prophylactic for malaria. Some people have a terrible reaction to some of the malarial drugs. So some of the, those people choose to take the risk of malaria or potentially another medication. And when the mandates came, I, I, I felt that they were not uh, justified. Um, but I just looked at it from a personal perspective. I'd been told not to. Um, well, I had been advised not to. Having been an, become kind of inadvertently, really, an unvaccinated person mm -hmm. and the ostracization, the stigma and the segregation and the punishment mm -hmm. that, that has been put yep. on to people who have, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. um, made that their choice or in many cases i mean most people say they didn't have a choice mm -hmm. how yeah how has your state vac status affected your life um well i had to be extremely circumspect in even discussing it with a lot of people because the few times i mentioned the predicament i was in some people were just apoplectic that i would even consider you know i was being selfish um, and I didn't feel selfish at that time because what I was seeing in the world didn't appear to be as dire uh, as to require someone that has a contraindication to have to have it, particularly because we were getting to quite high vaccine levels. So uh, the othering and the, the name calling of the unvaccinated um, very much made me sort of question what it must be like for people that that had a conscientious objection because I, I, you know, I fully sympathize with them, but I didn't, I didn't naturally come from that place. I had, I had, a my circumstance led me to think that this is the best thing for my, my health and wellbeing, um, from quite good advice. And I even wavered at one point because of the pressure, because I was going to, um, lose my job potentially, um, because I wouldn't be able to go and visit clients. Uh, so, but then I have a friend who had his aortic root and his aortic valve replaced and he got, and he's three or four years older than me, he got, uh, myocarditis and his wife's a GP and they wrote, um, a very long, uh, submission to the TGA or whoever the relevant authority is in Australia, um, about what he had suffered um, as a result. And it happened after his second shot. So that completely and utterly made me go, well, I'm utterly justified in my concern about this. He was in pain, he was hospitalized. He appears to have recovered now. He just has uh, a lethargy that he didn't have previously. And he had much more major heart surgery than me, that he, he, had, he had Marfan's disease, his heart, uh, his aortic root was paper thin. So he had to have a new aortic root done and a, and, and a new aortic valve. He has a, he has a, a bovine prosthetic valve. I have a, a porcine, e.g. a pig valve in my heart now. Um, so that just completely and utterly solidified for me that I was a, a, an absolutely resolute no because someone in my immediate circle who had willingly and happily taken the vaccine with a very similar con condition to me um, had, uh, had got myocarditis. Now, for example, if I go to the dentist, I have to take two or four grams of um, antibiotic before I have any dental work because the valve is a, a foreign body in my heart um, and it's very susceptible to bacterial infection. And, you know, that's what antibiotics cure. They don't, you know, obviously don't cure viral infections, but very susceptible to a bacterial infection. And um, so 
I was and am very aware of the fact that uh, I'm incredibly blessed and lucky to have had said heart operation, but at the same time, I have to take a 100 milligram aspirin every day. And, uh, and there's certain things I need to do to maintain um, good uh, levels of hygiene. So if I have a cut, bloodborne infection um, is very dangerous for someone like me. Um, and the fact that he had myocarditis, uh, that went on for months, just made me go, well, wh why, why, why would I take this risk? I'm, I'm in a very low risk category other than my heart. I'm uh, not overweight. I'm very fit and healthy. Um, I eat incredibly well. Uh, so for my personal risk reward equation, I was like, I don't really see... If I was 70 or 80, I probably would have had a completely different perspective, but I'm not. Um, and... Uh, and then I got COVID in late November of 2021. And I had four or five days of incredible muscle aches, particularly in my glutes, my bum cheeks and my, my thighs. I needed to take some pain medication. It was that excruciating. I had um, a fever for four or five days. Um, and then I came through it. And by day 10, when I was able to leave isolation, I was back to normal. Um, still a little tired, but not, not exhausted or wiped out. Uh, it wasn't the same sort of lethargy as prior to the heart operation. And by 15 days, I had no uh, thing. So I feel that I was quite justified in my, um, in my uh, choice. So I got COVID. I didn't give it to anyone. Um, I recovered from it. I was then blessed with natural immunity, um, which is only now becoming discussed in the, the broader sphere as being something that, you know, should be glaringly obvious because natural immunity has uh, been present with, you know, most viral infections. Um, and there was a lot of evidence a long time ago suggesting immunity. Uh, you know, people that had, um, had SARS and MERS uh, still have very strong immunogenic responses to that even now. Um, but I still was on the outer until I, I had to apply for a vaccine exemption, which expires in May. That's your medical story. Yes. Um, and your, le your medical learning and your, um, trusting both the advice you're getting in the hospital, but also presumably your intuition. Yes, undoubtedly. Yeah. Um, but COVID is much more than... A medical story mm -hmm. it's it's a political and cultural story as well yep. um what have you learned in those spheres about about the culture you live in and it was raised in and also the politics that are surrounding covid even with the cynicism that i had about power structures as a result of the experience that i referred to when i was in grade four um I still had faith in government functioning well for the people. And I guess for me, I've seen an atomization of our society as a result of COVID. Um, and for whatever reason, I think the government response has been less than helpful around mitigating the the trauma that the entire society has gone through um, as a result of COVID. Um, I think that there's some structural reasons for that, um, being social media, the fact that our media now is basically click driven. So um, if it bleeds, it leads is really um, the main driver because unfortunately human beings uh, gravitate towards stories of, uh, of conflict or distress over um, ideas of how we can improve our situation. So I think there were those things. Um, and then, but the, just to see in the media, the, the utter lack of nuance and the fact that someone like me, who's, um, vaccinated beyond what most people are because of my travel circumstances, um, was then put in, you know, the, the pejorative, you know, you're an anti-vaxxer because I wasn't, getting a vaccine for the reasons I've described, which I think were, you know, have been shown as time has gone to by to be a very valid choice at the time. Um, 
and I was, I guess for me, the other thing that really has struck me is the fact that if we call each other names, especially in our uh, immediate friendship community and our, our wider community, it, it completely destroys the ability to have a communication that's meaningful. Um, thankfully, I was ultimately able to have with some of my friends who were you know, really, really quite angry about my position uh, later on and, and, and explain it to them, you know, not via text, etc., cetera, um, and have them see that you know, ultimately that, that, you know, that my choice was A, my choice, but B, it was one that had been made from an informed position. It wasn't a reactionary anti-vax position. It was someone that had um, suffered, uh, you know, an enormous physical trauma uh, via open heart surgery. And I did not feel um, comfortable, particularly after my close friend who had had Marfan's disease and he'd had a heart operation, got the vaccine. So I, I fear that we, I hope that we will all, once this passes, actually look at what happened and see how we can avoid it from happening again, because I've never seen such hostility amongst close members of family, amongst communities. Um, the fact that if you asked a lot of people, you know, well, what do you think your chances of being hospitalised if you get COVID are, were, you know, many, many uh magnitudes of order larger than the actual risk they faced. And I don't blame those people for not understanding their risk because the narrative that was, it either it was an emergent phenomena, I don't, I don't profess to know why it happened the way it happened, but the end result was that there were a huge amount of people that were given information that led them to believe this erroneous thought that they were orders of magnitude more at risk than they actually were. Mm. I just wondered whether you just want to speak to where to now, like, you know, in terms of what you see in, in your community, your family, your community mm. space and the broader societal space, like what, what has to happen now? Um, firstly, at a civil liberties level, I would desperately like to see the doctor patient relationships sacrosanct uh, position reinstated because to me um, having been on the receiving end of egregious overreach of power grade four teacher um, I, I, that terrifies me and it, it, it is I've had many sleepless nights about that I've had very I've had many sleepless nights about um, people losing their jobs because they refused to undergo a medical procedure for whatever reason. Some of them may be valid, some of them may be invalid, but the fact that we can't even discuss that is even more terrifying. Um, so to restore the doctor-patientship relationship and also to, to reflect on how we've come to such a polarised position and try and understand what the actual mechanisms of it were. There's an enormous amount of um, conjecture amongst people as to why this has happened. Um, and maybe with time we can work it out. But uh, even if we can't get to the root cause of what was the emergent phenomena, as I like to think of it, because it gives me mental peace rather than to be in a place of assuming that there's a cabal of people trying to ruin us all. I think um, we have a society that has become very safety obsessed. Um, and that's come as a result of uh, litigation around uh, accidents, etc. So we've ended up, I think, accidentally straying down at the path of paternalism. And we feel that the government should look after us and every risk should be mitigated. And at one level, that's a fantastic concept. But if it runs amok, it then starts to... Uh, you start to have... Um, risk mitigation that then really impacts uh, many other aspects of life for a very, very, very fractional benefit. We're trying to mitigate risk, all risk, whereas uh, getting out of bed is a risky thing. Being alive is risky. Uh, so I think viewing what's happened through that lens also could be quite useful because I think part of the reason that so many people have um, 
been traumatized by what's happened, have uh, misunderstood the situation and its actual risk to the broader society. I mean, it's a very age stratified uh, disease. Uh, had we potentially isolated the vulnerable rather than isolating everyone, um, and we didn't really isolate the vulnerable. People that got it in a nursing home stayed in a nursing home, which doesn't seem from an infectious disease perspective to be very logical. So I think moving forward, we need to look at all of the things that did actually work um, during the pandemic, the things that did not, and then have a really honest conversation in our communities about how we face challenges that are similarly um, large as, as COVID, but, you know, there's a, a greater existential threat in the form of uh, ecocide and climate change. If we start calling each other names, we don't have any nuanced discussion. And most importantly, we don't actually have communication. If we're just shouting at each other, saying, you're wrong, I'm right. Well, then there can never be a, a meeting of minds about what is the best outcome. And so the point I'm trying to make is um, if we atomize and we start calling each other names, we can never find that practical, pragmatic uh, middle ground for one or, or a solution, because it may not be a middle ground, but without communication and, uh, and respect. And I think the thing that has most struck me about the entire experience, whether you uh, uh, were very pro-vax, anti-vax, or somewhere in the middle, is just the utter disrespect in the way uh, communication has come from governments, um, a pandemic of the unvaccinated, which was factually incorrect at the time and remains so. Um, so I, I think we need to try and ensure a civil discourse that is civil. Um, and so for me, that's, that's one of my major takeaways. And the other major takeaway for me is, is to be kind to those that don't agree with me because when everyone was terrified, locked down, stuck in their house, of course people are going to be uh, triggered because most of the normal day-to-day uh, -day things that happen in life and our normal coping mechanisms, me mechanisms were taken away as a function of the lockdowns, etc. cetera. Um, so I had some friends who were extremely angry towards anyone that was unvaccinated. And when the CFMEU protested, you know, one of them said, Vaxum, castrate them, uh, Vaxum, book them, Vaxum and castrate them. And I stopped, that was a, just a, uh, uh, an iPhone message thread. And I, I, for a few weeks, just didn't participate. Uh, I didn't respond because I didn't feel that I had the capacity to respond via text um, in a way that wasn't going to be inflammatory. And I eventually got a phone call from one of my friends and he said, well, you know, why are you not participating? And I said, well, I can't imagine what it's been like for you to have been in Melbourne's lockdowns because up here I've had a much easier time of it than you. So I couldn't say you're wrong because I haven't had your experience, but I couldn't abide or communicate in the hostile way you were communicating at the time. And I said, you know, and you said this, uh, book them, vax them and castrate them. And he said, oh, I was joking. And I said, oh, I don't think so at the time. And he went, you know, I, I actually, I really wasn't. Uh, he um, suffers from uh, an illness that made him very much in the vulnerable camp um, for very bad outcomes with COVID. Um, very, very high uh, on the list of someone that, you know, would happily, willingly, and should have taken the vaccine because it, it, you know, it, it gave him comfort. Um, so if we hadn't had an actual conversation, but we'd stayed in that text discussion, we would have probably had our friendship be irre irrevocably damaged. So one of the major learnings is if you can't say anything that's productive, because sometimes we have to say things that are not nice or comfortable, but if you can't say anything that's productive, maybe wait until you have an idea about how to communicate your concerns or needs or whatever it is that you're dealing with um, in a way that can be received by the other party as a communication rather than as a, a pejorative or an order. Uh, so that was one of the major things for me that I, I, I felt very lucky to be 46 rather than 26, because I think at 26, I would have been screaming from the treetops about how outrageous 
my friends were being and I would have probably become very positional but I realized that you know these are people I've known for 20 years and I love a lot and sure we both had you know we had distinctly different positions about the civil liberties erosion etc they weren't even worried about it which you know made my head want to explode um but at new year we all caught up because of all the restrictions were lifted and we we're able to see each other and we were able to have conversations and have conversations about the civil liberties issues um you know the overreach of the police etc uh so for me going forward at a personal level um i think just trying to stay focused on that um n as unemotive communication as possible trying to be calm as factual as i possibly can be i'm a human so i get things wrong you know we all do from time to time but coming from a place of as much fact as possible and and presenting it in a way that is respectful and kind hmm.